Las Vegas. This is NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast TV. Good afternoon again. We're back here at the NAB Show Live. And I see we've got a few more people sitting down. I reckon it's getting tiring on the feet and they're relaxing. So welcome, everybody. I'm Janet West, and today we're going to be talking on this afternoon about what cinematographers are making of the technology. If you imagine, a lot of cinematographers, particularly if they're on long documentary productions or on feature films, they're actually out of the uh, trade shows and not getting some of the information. So I want to find out what they're feeling about technology and how they keep up to date. So I've got three really interesting guys to join me. So I'd like to introduce... Um, ben J'ai le plaisir d'introduire <laughs> Philippe Renaudot. Philippe Merci Renaudot, beaucoup. who is CEO and founder of Firefly. Next to him, welcome back Miguel, who joined Thank me you. earlier. Miguel Angel de Doncel who is CEO of SGO. And then finally, to my but not least, is um, Peter Posner, who is Managing Director and of the Americas for Filmlight. Can cinematographers keep up with the technology? We find it difficult, we're in it. Well, I, please. No, no, I, th I think that, yeah, the, the cinematographer can definitely use the technology now. Um, they, they were probably I would say at the beginning of the digital cinematography, they were a little bit like, uh, I would say, like deer in the headlight, you know? They were a little bit lost by these new cameras, this new uh, workflow. But I think now it's getting easier and easier for them, um, especially with, with the software that we design. And um, yeah, I think now we can, we can definitely handle the, 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 this kind of... Uh, of, of yeah, actually, I think that even without knowing it, they are actually pushing the technology to move forward because uh, they may not know that they are requesting improvements to the technology, but they are always coming with a new idea. I want to do They're this. They're creative. To do that. Yeah, that's what they do. And uh, uh, so they are continuously creating new challenges, things that need to be done, and that is actually the source where, that we use to develop technology. So, yeah. yeah, I actually think they are not only able to do it, but they are also the reason why this evolution is happening. That's right. Uh, Peter. Yeah, I think one of the most challenging things for cinematographers is not so much keeping up with the technology, but making sure that they still have creative authorship over the image. They, they understand, you know, where technology is going. It's how, how, how to make sure it doesn't, you know, get into other people's hands. And, and they think, oh, well, I can do all this great stuff from the image, but make sure you're talking with the cinematographer and the director and achieving a creative vision not just using a tool because you can use it but using it for the for the right reasons so a lot of that uh, is involved in just conversations with cinematographers and making sure thing, things are utilized for the right reasons so how is development is it chicken and egg which comes first is it the cinematographers come to you guys and say i've got this fantastic idea how do you make me help it happen or is it you say, we think this would be really good and would enable you to do that? How does it work in the industry? In general, they are, they are first. They come with a crazy idea that yeah. they want to achieve, that uh, it's not possible to be done. And they know they what to do. They, uh, they know what they want to do. They may not know how to do it. And actually, they, most of the cases, they don't care about the technical aspects. They just want that to happen. Yeah. Uh, so that's our role in this equation, to try to find a good way to provide what they are looking for in a way that perfectly integrates in the workflow, giving them the flexibility to achieve their targets because they are creative people. They don't care about the technology. Some of them actually care a lot, but yeah. you will find both as kind of uh, directors. But uh, most of the times, they are the source of inspiration. They have the idea and then the, indus the technical industry comes with proposals for the solution. Well, I guess with Avatar, he had the idea about 15 years earlier than the technology enabled him to do it, wasn't it? Yeah. Peter, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think it can be a very iterative process. You know, a cinematographer will come up with a crazy idea and we'll, you know, do our best to realize it and then maybe say, oh, well, but we can also do this. And he says, well, if you can do that, can we push it even further? So there's definitely kind of a cycle of, of almost kind of trying to one-up each other sometimes as to how far we can take it and, and give them new creative tools, yeah. Mm -hmm. Philippe? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that they came for with such so many crazy ideas. I mean, the main idea is probably for them to, to get the, the best picture. And they, some, most of the time they don't really... Well, exactly like uh, maybe 15 years ago when we were shooting on film, most of the DP don't have any idea how Kodak or Fuji create the, the film stock, and they really don't care. And it's about the same now, actually. They, um, 
they know, just so want to know what you can do with it. Yeah, exactly. For, for example, I, I, I had the experience with a DP. He came, he came in my office, at my, in my office about three or four years ago, and told me, well, you know, I'm doing the first my, my first film in digital. I don't know anything about digital. I don't know anything about software. And to be honest, I really don't care. And because the software was designed for DP, he actually used it a lot. And, and, and he told me that he finally find the pleasure again to do cinematography thanks, <coughs> thanks to the software. And, and I think that's, that's a combination between uh, yeah, their needs, what they, what they wait for, and, yeah, and what we can offer to, yeah. to, to them. The session that I had earlier, which was on thinking spherically, talking about VR and AR, Certainly when I've worked with film uh, cinematographers, they're fairly traditional in some ways. They're very creative, but they're fairly traditional. What is their attitude towards VR? Or to, towards VR? Uh. Well, I think right, yeah. you will find any kind of people. And uh, there are people that like it a lot. There are people that are more conservative yeah. in the way they think. At the very end, I think, the amazing thing about the time that we are living at the moment is that we have a lot of new ways to communicate these stories. We, can, we have a lot of new improvements that give them the tools to uh, deliver higher quality content. And VR is part of that equation because, I mean, we have all the Stereo 3D uh, technology, we have the high dynamic range technology, we have higher frame rate technology, and we have VR. I mean, I wouldn't say one specifically is especially important or less. I think the, the cool thing about this is to have the opportunity to deal with all of those different technologies in one go and create with them, merging, mix, mixing things and doing maybe high frame range VR with HDR or putting things together. I mean, I think all of them like that kind of flexibility because that yeah. removes the technical uh, frontiers to their job and they can focus on the creativity. Yeah. Having said that, you will always find people that are more innovative and people that mm. think it twice before risking the project. Both po points of view are really, I mean, makes a lot of sense. So, so I guess if the cinemas change a lot, then yeah. probably they'll, yeah. they'll have the, to. The industry is changing a yeah. lot in general. Peter, your comment on VR. Yeah, well, I think the, the role of cinematographers has really expanded quite a bit over the years. So you have cinematographers getting involved in animated films or films that are so heavily CGI, mm -hmm. they may as well be, be animated films. Um, and yeah, cinematographers involved in virtual reality as, as well. So yeah, where it used to be just about the cinematographer pick, picking the film stock and the lens and, and helping frame it, they're, they're now often involved in, in kind of just more general look development. Even for, for video games, you have cinematographers getting involved in, in video games. So there's yeah. a, a lot of opportunities to leverage their ex expertise in how to author an image, how to you know control lighting to make sure the viewer is looking at you. Want, well, that, Want, want them to be viewing, and that's certainly something that's important in, in VR and video games and all sorts of mediums. So. Okay. Let's move on and talk about workflows. Now, with a lot of the shows that I've done, I've found loads of acronyms, so I've come up with, I found another one, and it's um, BLG. Do you want to tell me about that <laughs> and Filmlight? What are yeah. the advantages of it, and uh, what is it? So basically, like grade file or a BLG is basically just all your color metadata for a specific shot and actually a reference of, of the image itself. So uh, a DP on set can, can capture an image of what they're looking at uh, when they're adjusting the color and then send all those color settings to be applied in dailies and to be blind in, in editorial VFX posts. So the same color can be applied uh, throughout the production chain so that the cinematographer always gets their creative intent for what the color is across. Okay. Um, any comment on workflow, Miguel? Yeah, I honestly think that uh, as I, uh, what he said is a great idea because at the very end it's quite important to give the people the flexibility to try to maintain the metadata from the very beginning, from the very end of the production. Yeah. And nowadays people need a lot of flexibility, so the technology has to be extremely flexible in order to deal with any kind of aspects of the um, post-production process. So we honestly believe that in order to achieve that flexibility, it's quite important to have tools that are able to put together not only one part of the post-production, like only editing, only color grading, but also have the ability to tweak every, every single aspect of the post-production in one go when you are finishing the movie. Because nowadays people need a lot of flexibility, they change their mind many, many times and they cannot 
uh, for them anymore going back in the process, going to previous stages, going back to editing or going back to VFX because that costs a lot of time, costs a lot of money. They need to fix those things as we speak. And uh, I honestly see, think in the future technology will grow and is growing. At least we are trying to grow in that direction, providing the people the flexibility that can help them to change anything, anytime, without losing any time. Any, yeah, without losing any extra time. That's very important in my opinion. What does it mean to cinematographers these days to have the visual effects tools in the mastering suite? Um, well, I think it's again just kind of creating the uh, expanding the creative palette of what they can do in the in the DI suite or in the color correction suite. So, uh, particularly for those things that come up at the last minute, because the the usually the very last creative step of movie making is when you sit down in a color correction bay. You have all your final authorship of the image, and then right after that, it has to ship out to theaters and DVD and everything else. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's really an opportunity to to fix those little things that you. If you did before, if you didn't catch early, you wouldn't be able to fix. So little little beauty fixes, little makeup fixes. Uh, you know, again, just drawing the eye to the right part of the the screen and being able to de-emphasize other other parts of the screen. Um, and it also just be enables getting more done quickly. You know, if you want to quickly do sky replacements, uh, you can do that in the DI suite now rather than having to send it off to VFX and wait for a week to come in, for it to come back and realize it's been done wrong and having to send it back again. So just allows you to have much more control over the image um, in a much quicker way. Okay. Any comments on that? Yeah, yeah I think <clears throat> I think for the well there is the special effect and special effect is part of, of, of the of the process for sure. And I, I think the next big thing is definitely the glue. I mean we, we have all the tools but what is missing is probably the glue between all these different tools. And it will be the next the next well, actually it's 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 the big thing right now. It's how we can uh, offer a, a, a global solution from onset to the post to the DPs, DIT, all the people, all the creative people involved in, in, in the digital cinematography. Okay, so all three companies here, what exciting things can people at NAB learn from you guys at this year? Well, we, we show here at, uh, at NAB uh, the, the, the new version of our product and it's really uh, a complete workflow from uh, onset to the post including live grading, uh, digital dailies and final grading. That's, that's what we do. Actually, that's what we do from the very beginning at, at, uh, at Firefly. We had uh, this, uh, let's say, vision that uh, we, we, we need to offer a global solution uh, to. To the to the to the people involved in, in the in the creativity of uh, for the to, to create to create a, a feature film, and um, so also we uh, show uh, and we we talk about the glue. I was talking about the glue. Now we are also uh, demoing our software on the Excel booth. So we have a, 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 a very close relationship between Excel, which is a major asset manager. So really the, the, the metadata and all this kind of, uh, of uh, information that we have on set has to be saved and update into the, 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 the media set manager. So that, that's what we show on, on, on the show floor uh, this year. Okay, Miguel. Yeah, what, what we are presenting, actually we are presenting quite a lot of things, but probably the most important one and the most interesting one is uh, Mystica 87, which is uh, our proposal for the finishing uh, process of the post-production, as he was saying before. When the director is finishing the movie, they, he wants to have control over all the aspects of the uh, final production, not only color, but if they want to do a, a sky replacement or something like that, they want to be able to do it. But not only that, if they want to change, if it is a 3D movie and they want to change the convergency of the clips, or if it is a VR project and they want to change aspects related, uh, related with VR, we are providing the, the people the ability to change all of those things in real time in the same system. So when they sit down to finish the movie, they actually can finish the movie because okay. there is no problem they cannot fix on the fly as they go, mm -hmm. which is a very, in our opinion, is a very interesting approach to the finishing process. Yeah. Peter, you mentioned the Filmlight BLG. What else can people at the show expect to see on the Filmlight stand? So, yeah, Filmlight, we're all about color finishing and, and color mastering. So, 
uh, we're launching a new release of, of all our products. And it, it started many years ago with uh, Base Light, which was just our color finishing tool, but is now a full workflow suite of tools from Pre-Light, which is our onset tool that DPs and DITs can use to manipulate the color. Uh, Daylight, which is our dailies transcoding tool for creating deliverables for editorial and VFX. Uh, and then we have plugins for Avid and for Nuke to get the same colors applied in editorial and VFX. So you can see how the color goes uh, throughout the production chain and we have the same tools available at, at all of those, uh, including a new tool called Base Grade, which is a new way of uh, adjusting the color in a way the camera uh, sees color and the human eye sees color. So you can adjust exposure after the fact and a true color temperature after the fact. Uh, so we're pretty excited to be showing that at the show. Uh, and also have a new release of, of Base Light Student, which is for people to learn our software because it can sometimes be hard to, you know, to get to a, a, a base light finishing suite, uh, which is often very busy, you know, tied up with projects. So it allows colorists to take the base light software home and learn more about how to use, particularly those more advanced tools like paint and uh, grid warping and, and perspective tracking, which are kind of more VFX tools. They now have a, a version they can take home on their laptop and, and learn some more about how to how to take advantage of those tools. I think this is interesting because in a lot of the shows that we've had this week, education has come up quite a lot because with the technology changing so quickly, how do we keep uh, you know the skill set moving and and able to satisfy what customers need? Are you helping? media colleges, that sort of thing, to, to deal with this? Or are you finding you're having to create software tools to train? We, we for, for example, at Firefly, we are really uh, close to uh, some French school, like uh, Louis Lumière, for example, or uh, some, some university. But yeah, that's really part of the, that's really important for, for, for us and for the industry that the people can be uh, train and knows exactly how to use the software and, and, and the solutions. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, the students are the future of the industry and it's extremely important to help them to learn the new technology because they will be the people using it in the near future and, and yeah. for the time being. So we, for them, they have a special version of the software which is Mystica Insight, which is a completely functional version of the software for learning purposes, which is because we honestly think it's extremely important to help the new generation of people to put hands on the technology. Yeah. And, and we've also been working with uh, professional guilds like the Editors Guild or the American Society of Cinematographers because yeah, even professionals need to constantly keep up to date on all the changing HDR standards and things like that. So yeah, we're very involved in trying to help uh, put together educational opportunities just to kind of update people on what, what the state of the industry is, what uh, the different options are with the different technologies. Yeah. Okay. Could you mention a, a particular production that you've been involved in that's used some interesting um, parts oh. of your tools? Yeah, we, we, yes, we, we, did, we did a very nice, uh, uh, well actually our client did a very nice uh, uh, French feature film called History of Love. And it's, uh, actually it has been shot in uh, Montreal, New York and Romania. And all the labs and, and the, the, the finishing uh, color grading has been done in uh, in Paris, and it was really nice because they use uh, our product all the way along of the production, and including uh, some systems uh, in the hotel room of the of the DP. So every night the the DIT uh, give to the DP a, a, a drive, um, and the DP was able to, to to make the modification very easily, bring the uh, send the, the modification back to to the DIT, and then all the metadata follow all the way along to, 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 to Paris and, and actually, as, as we said, um, uh, a few months after, after the editing, they were able, the, 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 the company in charge of the post-production was able uh, to do the conformance into, into Firepost and automatically all the color grading decided by the DOP during the shooting were uh, all automatically applied on the shots and it was a really good experience, really nice. Okay. Do, does the cinematographer sometimes feel with all the different stages these days that they're losing some creative um, ownership or are they feeling that they can stay much more of a part of it throughout the workflow? It's, well, in, in our experience, it's really depending on the production, really depending. Sometimes uh, ADP is involved in only uh, during the shooting, um, but most of the time now more and more they're involved all the way along of the production. and the, Come back uh, on the um, during um, for the for the final color grading, and yeah. I think that's really important. That's that's uh, because 
that's where we um, almost finish the color and where we almost uh, finish the, the, the pictures. That, so that's, that's really important that DDP is involved all the way along. Yeah, Miguel, can you touch on a production that you've been involved in? What, many? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, we've uh, only got uh, three minutes left. <laughs> That, but yeah, I totally agree with him. I mean, I think the key, uh, I could give several examples, but for example, in the, the Hobbit the trilogy, the three movies of them, actually, I think one of the key aspects of the, the, probably the two main aspects of the innovation the technology was providing to the director, in that case, uh, Peter Jackson, was uh, one hand to be able to deal with uh, what at that time was the first high, fr uh, high frame rate movie yeah. that was delivered. It was quite a challenge. And the challenge actually was to how to give those, those people, his team, tools to work with that kind of material in a way that is transparent for them uh, compared with the normal workflow they were used uh, to follow. But on top of that, giving them the ability and the possibility to integrate footage coming from uh, VFX software, from Wida Digital, or coming from other uh, providers, put everything together in a single system in which they can just sit down, see how the movie is looking, and fix everything, from color to stereo 3D adjustments, etc. That kind of flexibility is actually a tool incredibly valuable for the director, because going to the point you were mentioning, they can actually focus in the creative aspects of the movie, and they don't have to care about the technical limitations. If you are working with double the bandwidth because it's a stereo, or eight times more bandwidth because it's a stereo and double frame rate, yeah. they don't care. They just sit down, look the result, they like it, great, they don't, they change it. That kind of flexibility that requires a lot of performance, a lot of functionality and a lot of connectivity between between tools. Those three things together, I honestly think, are very valuable for the, uh, the creators. Guys, we're running out of time. I can't continue. What a shame. I hope you've learned a lot, the audience and you at home. And uh, I'd like to thank very much my three guests, Philippe Renaudot and uh, Miguel uh, Angel Doncel. And, of course, Peter Posma from uh, Filmlight. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, the audience. And I'm Janet West. I will be here tomorrow where we're going to start learning about what are going to be the exciting trends over the next year and the top ten predictions for the next year. See you then. Have a great evening. Stay safe in Vegas. Hey guys, Nikki from NAB Show Live, and I'm here with Evan Gronke. He's the Senior Product Manager of AMD. How's it going, Evan? Fantastic. Great start to the show so far. Yeah, it's exciting. I'm excited. Uh, very, very exciting. Lots of great things to show today uh, from our Radium Pro Graphics uh, product family. Uh, lots of partners here and uh, tons of exciting things. Great. Um, very exciting. I want to talk about this next to us. But first, tell me a little bit about AMD. So, well, AMD uh, has been one of the leading graphics providers for a number of years. Uh, a lot of exciting things have happened in the last year. Uh, we rebranded our entire professional product, uh, product line last year at SIGGRAPH with uh, Radeon Pro Graphics, introduced a number of fantastic products from our WX series product lines featuring the latest architectures and the latest uh, graphics uh, process nodes. Um, and here we are today, uh, ready to start talking about uh, our latest and greatest products that we just launched this morning. I know, I heard. So now that you're allowed to talk about it, tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, so what we have today is uh, the Radeon Pro Duo. Uh, what it is essentially is the latest and greatest iteration of essentially our WX7100. And what we've done is we've shoehorned in a single graphics card that fits in pretty much any standard OEM PC uh, two highly powerful uh, uh, GPUs. And what it does is it allows you to do fantastic things like what you see behind us right now is simultaneous workloads like real-time 360 degree video stitching plus on the other GPU do amazing things like this 360 display with the warping and then send that content over to our other display over here where you can actually do a VR head mount display so amazing things you can do with the power of these GPUs these days so it's stitching warping and sending it to the VR well yeah it's stitching and warping and then the output of the stitching is actually being sent to another PC behind us that has another GPU in it that's doing the the VR uh, head mount display 
So cool. Thank you so much for speaking with us. I want to play with this stuff. So can we do that? Absolutely. Yeah. Jump on in. All right. Thank you, Evan. This is Nikki with NAB Show Live. Ryan Saddles here with NAB Show Live. We have a very special guest right now, America Ferreira. How you doing? Good, thank you. Trying to keep my voice here in Vegas. <laughs> so, 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 congratulations! You just got the uh, the Television Chairman's Award at NAB Show today. That's right. So, how does that feel? It feels great. It's an incredible honor to be uh, recognized by the Association of Broadcasters, and um, and you know to be honored specifically for um, the representation that that the work I've been lucky enough to do has created in the industry. All right. So you know, Ugly Betty, that was an awesome show. That's when I first learned of you. Um, you've got to be proud of that. But now you're now you're working on another show. Yes. And it's your baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of my, yeah, yeah, well, kind of. It was my infant. It was someone else's baby. Okay. Um, uh, Justin Spitzer, who worked on The Office for, for six years, um, created this wonderful show. And, and it's about, you know, everyday people working at a cloud nine you know insert walmart target and any kind of big box store um and and it's just about people from all walks of life uh coexisting and and there's so much room for for humor but also for smart poignant um commentary not necessarily you know um uh, there, there's, there's not necessarily a message so much as it is so many people's different perspectives on any given issue, um, cre and, and mining that for, for the humor. And so I, I hear that you're really big on women's issues and, and Hispanic issues. I think that's really awesome. Thank you. And, and so you're very involved with the community. I, I've been, yeah, I've been involved with, um, with a number of communities and I'm really big on on just like people I'm big on people being represented and having a voice and feeling empowered and uh, and and I've done work with women people and with Latino people and all other kinds of people all right excellent all right America Ferrera the one the only right here uh, in a hidden location at NAB show <laughs> we'll go right back to the studio Hey, this is Rob Rush from 94.3 The Shark here on Long Island, and you are watching NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast Beats. Live from Las Vegas, this is NAB Show Live. <laughs> Hello, welcome to NAB Show Live. Here we're covering topics on VR, uh, new media, and augmented reality. Today I'm Caitlin Burns, and I'm going to be hosting VR distribution. I think this is a question that has come up again and again in the panels we've been show, uh, presenting here at NAB. And I'm so, so excited to have two amazing experts in the field with me today. Alyssa Crevier, the Global Head of Brand Partnerships for Little Star VR, and Greg Catano, who is the CEO of the VR Cage. Yeah. Um, Alyssa, tell us a little bit about Little Star and what you guys do and provide in the VR space. Yeah, so Little Star is a global distribution platform and we distribute only 360 and VR premium content agnostically across any device, any headset, iOS, Android, Apple TV, basically anywhere you would ever want to ingest VR or 360. So if you want to see a really high quality, excellent 360 or cinematic VR piece, you can go to your phone, you can go to your Oculus, your Vive, uh, your, your uh, Samsung Gear or your Google Daydream and go to the Little Star app and get started, right? You got it, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Greg, tell us a little bit about, I mean, you have been in virtual reality forever, it feels like, and you have, have been working so hard to make sure that audiences get a chance to connect, not just with the software and the pieces, but the hardware as well. Tell us a little bit about what you're up to. Wow, thank you for that intro, and, <laughs> and it's nice to be here. Thank you for you sitting in the audience. Uh, so uh, I, I've been in virtual reality for a little bit, uh, about three years now, and um, the, the, the first thought was to get the widest access mm -hmm. and uh, it was Google Cardboard. I thought, mm -hmm. oh gosh, there's 2.5 billion smartphones out there and here you have this inexpensive uh, enabler. So <laughs> I, uh, I 
approached uh, unofficial cardboard and they hired me on the spot, which was amazing. <laughs> and um, you know, because I've been in entertainment for a long time in 3D, yeah. that it was a really good fit. And I just went out there and evangelized it and realized that distribution is probably the, the, the number one uh, question on everyone's mind, is that we have a lot of content creators out there, um, but there's this huge chasm between the content creators and the consumers. And without the consumers, you know, yeah. we're not gonna get paid or, or, or we, we don't have a business. And I saw that happen in 3D when I was when I was really involved in 3D. So the VR arcade is is really uh, one of those those points where we can get it out to the you know uh, to the public yeah. uh, with this um, uh, uh, location based model. Yeah. And so um, yeah. uh, if, if, if I may do a shameless plug, yeah. uh, we're we're at the MGM tomorrow. So um, uh, at the uh, MGM Hakkasan and Level Up, um, we're going to have a VR arcade with. 14 of the you know most popular um, uh, VR experiences mm -hmm. and a bunch of influencers. So if anybody yeah. out there wants to come check it out, yeah. um, you know we're gonna we're gonna yeah. end the end the NAB show with that. So I'm glad you brought up cardboard because I think when we're talking about virtual reality, most of the people who have seen it have either seen a 360 video on a platform like a YouTube or a Facebook, right. or they've had a chance to see something on a provide a distribution partner like Little Star, but maybe through the cardboard uh, headsets, which are, you know, the foldable pieces that you see a lot. The New York Times shipped out up to a million subscribers. It right. was one of the opening salvos of the VR distribution market. But Alyssa, tell us, where are people watching VR on Little Star? Yeah, so we see the majority of the traffic coming in through PlayStation VR. And then from there, it goes to iOS, Android, Gear VR, um, and then kind of at the bottom in terms of headsets, it, it, you'll get to uh, the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive only because I think there there's a barrier to entry only because of the, um, the expense in which the PC or the, the machine that you need to run e equipment like that, like the Vive or the Rift is very expensive so the average consumer can't necessarily afford a you know yeah. a two thousand dollar um, alienware computer so so definitely playstation vr we've seen immense growth in, uh, with that piece of hardware um, yeah. yeah so uh at little star you're one of the the you're one of the groups that I think of first when I think of distribution as a creator of VR or working with brands as a partner that you simply must have in your in your production. Simply because um, if you're actually putting something out to an audience, you can go onto a Facebook or YouTube, but it's not going to have the same resolution necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the biggest problems we're facing with virtual reality is the fragmentation. As a creator, you can go through and have your own piece in one place, or you can partner with a group like Little Star and put it out all over. How big a deal has that been for creators and in your work with brands? Yeah, yeah it's huge. I mean, that's why we exist, and that's you know that's how the co-founders started Little Star. They got their hands on um, on Oculus when they first came out, and they were looking for content, and they couldn't. They they found content, but it was all in different places. So they they thought why don't we create one place in which all VR and 360 lives? Right. Um, and that, and there, there came Little Star. So it's, you know, it is extremely important. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, there's also, there are also mechanisms like u utilizing embeds from Little Star. So you can actually take the video, a brand could take their video and use it in their own social channels or on their website. And it, they would use our, you know, our player through that embed. So there are ways, in addition to having content on Little Star, to have to for brands to utilize that content on their own channels as well. Yeah. Some of the most exciting ways that I've seen virtual reality pieces or even 360 are in the room scale. And that's also something that really comes with live installation. Right. Greg, what is the difference between experiencing a piece of virtual reality in a sort of at-home environment or in a big social arcade environment like what you're building? Right. Well, I think the social aspect and the community is really exciting to me. Uh, a little story, I was, uh, I was a DJ in LA uh, back in the day, I won't even tell you when, but um, I used to tell people that I wasn't the most technical DJ, I wasn't you know, even close to how good these other guys were at scratching, uh, at mixing, 
but my dances were huge. You know, I, my, my events were huge, and it was almost like pre-social media, where <laughs> I um, pulled in these influencers from all these different parts of LA, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, downtown, Venice, uh, the Valley, even Orange County, yeah. and they would bring all the people because they knew that they would have a really good time. Uh, Chris Cristatelli and I, uh, who, who started the VR Arcade, we mm -hmm. saw that as a really good aspect to the VR Arcade where we started reaching out to a lot of our friends that were these influencers in the VR space. Mm -hmm. and lovely, lovely people, uh, very knowledgeable, and they're really the bigger evangelists in the, in the VR space. So I reached out to them and you know, without hesitation, they all signed on. So not only do I see, do we see the VR arcade as being a place where the public uh, can experience these um, uh, devices, like you said, may not have the money to, to experience. Mm -hmm. So here's a way, just like IMAX VR, where you know you, you, you pay a little bit and you can try all these different experiences. Mm -hmm. I think that model is great. Uh, what, what we're hoping to do is uh, make it about the, 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 the social aspect too. Mm -hmm. So I, I came up with this tagline, I said, you know, come for the VR, stay for the community, because yeah. I want people to be there and feel mm -hmm. that they can ask questions for all these very influential people in VR, because it's such a giving community. Yeah. And my friend Angela is sitting out <laughs> in the crowd, and, and another one of the, the lovely ones in, in, the, in the space. So there's so many great people, you know, even the two of you. It's like we've known each other <laughs> through social media and through, you know, just hearing about the, the amazing work that that you guys are doing. So well, I think that that's what we can bring and, and that'll leave the impression yeah. on top of the VR experience. I think everyone who's involved with the field can't help but be energized by the amount of experimentation and the new ways that people are exploring. Absolutely. How we create these immersive, present environments and how we can add interactivity into them. And when we're talking about live events, sometimes this is the only way you can see the newest experiment with interactivity. Or people are building full room, uh, full uh, only uh, unique event spaces like The Void. Uh, right. And I believe they're in the void. Utah, New York with yep. their Ghostbusters experience, Dubai and Los Angeles, um, where you're actually inside a VR experience inside a building and able to go through and have full range of motion in a full sensory environment. Yep. Um, what is, um, what was the first piece of virtual reality or 360 content that really got you, that made you feel like this is something that I am so excited to be working on? Um, for me, I, I think that right now one of my favorites is My Brother's Keeper, um, just in terms of cinematic VR. Great it's, piece. It's great and it's at the end, you can't believe that you have just been in it for 10 minutes. It's a, it's a longer piece of VR, but you don't feel like that at all. And so there's a storyline, and I think the storytelling there is just <laughs> superb. And can, can people find My Brother's Keeper on Little Star? They can, yes. I recommend they you can. check it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, for you, Greg, tell us about the, the, the piece that really drives you wild. Right. So I had seen some experiences before the one that I'm going to talk about. But this was the one that basically convinced me that I had to be all in. Mm -hmm. And it was a Showdown by Epic Games. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had waited two hours at CES <laughs> and looking at my watch going, wow, I hope that I'm going to you know, be able to you know, get in and check this out. And it was worth the wait. So I, uh, it was 10 vignettes. The last one was Showdown. And here, you guys all remember the Matrix. You know, you have these slow motion bullets with the bullet tracers behind the bullet coming at you. I had time to look at the bullet as it was coming at me, look underneath it, look at all the detail when I'm by, and, and, and when a ra rocket hits the side of a building and the debris cloud completely envelops my head, I said, wait a minute, I know, I know 3D, I know stereo, and I can't figure out how they, you know, how they, you know, had the displacement and the and the you know motion blur. Everything was just so real that to this day, it's basically a, a, an imprinted memory in my mind that I was on that video game street, mm -hmm. and I as soon as I walked out, I started te sending text messages to my friends saying, uh, "I just saw something that just changed my life, and I'm <laughs> in." And they know I'm super pragmatic as as well as being a very blue sky entrepreneur. But I said, uh, "This is different." This is the first time that I felt that I was not just an observer of media, but a participant. 
I think anyone who's worked in virtual reality and, and walked people through their first VR experience is familiar with that moment where you, you just get that awe. Right. It's a great experience. It's something where it's a whole new feeling. But in the last technology revolutions, especially in media, a lot of the conversations were about data, about analytics, about being able to share something with a huge addressable market and get immediate feedback. How do you work with Little Star, with your creators, to provide similar tools to track what's going on and what are people asking for in terms of KPIs? Yeah, um, I think that one of the ways in which we're able to deliver, uh, deliver data back to content creators or brands, we actually have heat mapping technology where we're tracking um, your pupils wherever you're looking inside of a headset multiple frames per second. So we then generate a heat map uh, for content creators to see, hey, during this scene, the majority of your audience, they were looking over here at the sky when you actually really wanted them to be looking at this puppy. And the, I mean, and right. so what you're able to do as a content creator is tweak your piece of content and put audio cues or different kinds of, uh, you know, different different elements, sound, light, etc., to then help the audience look at what you really want them to look at. So that's a tool. And then also I think for R&D, for brands and for networks, um, you know, character development, that kind of thing, they really love the heat maps as well. And then other data is just more or less, you know, we're able to provide brands with information around where are, where are people ingesting VR the most? Is it PlayStation? Is it, uh, you know, is it uh, iOS or Apple TV? So we, we're able to break down all the completion rates, video views, impressions, um, quartile tracking <laughs> by device as well. So that's been helpful. Therefore, they know where to kind of hone in and get to know more about their audience. That's very exciting. If I may say yeah, something to that. Yeah, of course. Is that uh, immediately when I, I looked at cardboard, uh, I, I saw that as just a commodity. That um, you know, people will give these away, people will try to race to the bottom to come up with the lowest price for these. But when, when you take an enabling device like cardboard and mobile and pair it up with a platform like Little Star, now you have a network. Mm -hmm. Now you have that very powerful uh, ongoing engagement with the consumers, which is the entire game, which is why the most powerful tech companies out there are so successful, is that they, they know how to target, they know how to take that data and, and customize the experience. So now you, 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 you know, take that framework, but you also put it in an immersive environment, now it's, it's next level that you know, we've never seen before. So. So tell us a little about, about who you're working with. Who's coming to you and asking, how do I solve for virtual reality? What is it that we can do that's going to get people excited? Yeah, everybody. <laughs> um, I, I find that a lot of my time is taking up kind of evangelizing the medium of VR, um, educating brands, educating agencies, educating large networks about VR and why the memory that you walk away with after experiencing VR is much different than a 2D piece of content in which you ingest and leave. This is actually, because you are in the experience, it is creating this memory for you. Um, so the power of that. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of agencies um, that are representing brands that are actually, you know, now now paying for ad advertising space on on Little Star, and um, we're so we're experimenting there with a lot of monetization and models and what what it will look like. So a lot of the time, I've heard VR and advertising compared to podcasting and advertising. Mm -hmm. What are some of the ways you're experimenting with placing those against an experience, or do they interrupt the experience? What What's the thinking at the moment? Yeah, yeah. we try. We're trying not to have them interrupt the experience at all. Can you imagine how jarring it would be to be in a VR experience and then all of a sudden interstitial. Your, your brain would be extremely angry at you. You'd probably, I think, get sick. 
Um, and so what we're doing is more of product placement within an experience. Um, and then also some advertising around, you know, if there's a show, say, on sci-fi, um, doing a piece with the actors or actresses before or after and actually interviewing them about the piece, and that's brought to you by Mountain Dew or whatever um, brand it is. Uh, and then, um, you know, we're doing homepage takeovers in headsets, so when you are on the Little Star menu page in a headset, you can actually, it, it can be branded Nissan all around you. Um, right now, Nissan and Star Wars is uh, the featured content on Little Star, and that's that's a piece of content that they've created in 360. But it's it's also a, you know a branded content piece. I think th it's interesting to see how many TV shows and brands are coming out with branded content, where it's immersing someone in their world. Do you find your approach more by brands or by agencies bringing that content to your platform? It depends. Short-term agencies, I think long-term it takes the brand, and this is uh, the same of uh, new or old medium, but brand direct takes a little bit longer in my, in my experience, so the sales cycle becomes longer with the brands um, because it's more about an overall strategy when you're working with a brand. What are your initiatives in the next two, three years? Let's build out a VR plan that builds into those initiatives. Whereas with the agencies, it seems to be more about a, a media buy. And then I think there's there's another thing I, I did not mention, but I think um, we also are playing around with monetization in, in actually charging um, consumers for specific premium content so that we can also, in turn, um, reward our content creators for the hard, the extremely hard work that has gone into creating entertain, entertaining VR. Greg, when you're putting together these, these events, who are you looking for to showcase? Are you looking for independent creators? Are you looking for brand or network pieces? What is it that helps you decide what should go here to make this the most exciting a engagement in a in a physical space for people to share. Right. Uh. So uh, Chris Crisatelli was the founder of the 3D Fest, which then became the Virtual Reality Festival when VR came into came into light. And uh, Chris and I have known each other for a long time, and and we we're always looking for ways to help proliferate the the movement, mm -hmm. if you will, and uh, you know really give a voice to these content makers. So um, about last year, I started working with Chris on the Virtual Reality Festival. And that was a, a really nice outreach to the community and allowed uh, the independent content makers of, of VR to display their um, experiences. And that was, that was great because you know, Chris wouldn't take any money. He would just um, you know, try to get it sponsored or it would come out of his own pocket because he knew that, hey, listen, this is a very nascent uh, um, a business, so let's, uh, let's really see if we can help the community. So that became um, uh, uh, anybody, you know, if, if anybody, mostly independents, to bring their content and showcase it. And then our concept with the virtual reality arcade, especially tied in with Vegas, we thought, let's really display all of these over-the-top commercial experiences that you hear, um, uh, you know, raw data and uh, uh, rock band and you know, tilt brush, which a lot of us have experienced, but it's magic nonetheless. So uh, you know, we're really trying to go for the, the biggest you know, uh, common denominator with tomorrow's, you know, tomorrow's event. But between the two, I think it, it really reaches out to the, to the widest audience. So what's next? What's exciting in VR to me is that we're seeing this field emerge not just from film, but interactive gaming. Uh, it's bridging all of these platforms that have previously been disconnected and are now connecting in new right. ways. Where is it going to go next? What's exciting you about where the field is headed? Uh, I think we're, uh, we've been asked a lot by content creators for uh, the ability to have more interactivity within Little Star. So that's something, first and foremost, that we're focusing on. I think another thing that I'm mostly excited about is, you know, oftentimes we talk about 
um, VR being a 360 or VR being a very um, solitary uh, experience. You have a headset on and you're watching it, but it's hard to share that experience with somebody else. But imagine if you have, um, instead of just one piece of glass in your living room as a television as it exists today, the entire room is, surra is surrounded by glass, so it becomes a 360 experience within your own living room, and we get to watch it together and experience something together. Right. And another aspect of that is, um, you know, viewing 360 and VR in a in a dome structure. Um, so we're we're working on what that looks like as well. That's an exciting way to think about live event and distribution. Greg, what's the most exciting piece that's coming next in the industry to you? The most exciting piece, I, I feel, is the fact that it, not just entertainment, it, it also reaches out to all these enterprise uh, uh, industries. And that's the first thing that I identified was that with entertainment, when we had a lull, whether through a strike or, or tax you know, credits taking work out of the, out of the state, that the town just dried up. And when virtual reality came around or came on our radar, I said, wow, look at this. It's gonna help medical and philanthropy and training and education. And because of that, because of the fact that it trans so many in, uh, transcends so many industries, that I feel that this has uh, uh, more viability than any other media movement. And the other thing that I bring up is, as soon as I got into virtual reality, I started getting in touch with people in augmented reality, as we're all familiar with, and then uh, artificial intelligence and robotics, and, and so it's a true convergence. I've never seen anything like it. It's, it's unprecedented that it's a true convergence of all these different emerging technologies, and they're very complementary. So, um, you know, and, and you know, looking at Facebook Spaces and, and their big announcement, and, and um, you know, how uh, the, the, the momentum is not slowing. You know, when you have the biggest tech companies behind a movement like this, uh, I don't think any of us are are uh, going to be aware of of how this is going to develop and how quickly. But like, hang on and go for the ride. And, and I think if we're open to that, we're we're all going to really prosper from it all. Uh, well, I, I think uh, to sum up what I've been hearing, it's an exciting field where we're able to experiment with all of these different technologies and bring together people from different specialties. And right. for those of you who are looking to get into the field, you should reach out and try. And for those of you with 360 content, there are people with solutions to the exhibition questions and the distribution questions like Little Star, uh, who are there to be interested in helping you navigate it, like Greg Catano here. Um, I hope that you all will go to littlestar.com on whatever device you want to watch your 360 pieces on. Right. And uh, if you're here at NAB in Las Vegas, that you join us at the VR Pavilion later, or you go to Greg's VR Arcade on Thursday. Thank you. Um, any quick thoughts before we wrap? No, thank you so much for having us. And thank you, thank audience you. and broadcast beasts and thank NAB you, Show Live. Ryan Saddles are here with Broadcast Beat. Today we have a very special guest, Bill Thompson with Edit Share. How you doing? Great, great. How do you do? Doing great. So, so what does NAB Show mean to an organization like you? Well, this is the, the, the place where all of our buyers come. You know, we focus on the video post-production business, and so read half the badges coming through here, and a lot of people are here to shop for the next generation of production equipment. So I, I, I see your scalable solution. Uh, that's probably for much larger organizations, right? Um, that's how it started out. Sure. And what I like to say is, you know, it's one matter to build a system that's going to scale out as large as 5, 10, 15, or 20 petabytes. Really, the news from us this year at this show is that we've managed to scale it in so that a small team, a small company, or, you know, just someone starting out can start with something as small as a single node, which is quite affordable, which can be the basis of their entire workflow and as they grow, our system grows with no forklift upgrades. And from what I remember, your, your products, you have a software management system as well, right? Yeah, you have a good memory, yeah. So we actually bundle that product, which is called Flow, and we also bundle an archive and backup product called Arc right. in the same product. So it really does become the heart of a workflow. 
with a simple, you know, low-cost purchase. I mean, you're just sort of managing assets with it, right? Yeah, we sure do. Yeah, we've got a very world-class asset management platform that's uh, widely accepted. Excellent. Yeah, you guys are quite a popular uh, platform to be working on in facilities. Talk about Xtreme. What's that? Is that the, that's the solution you were just mentioning? Um, it's Extreme EFS, and the EFS part of it means edit share file system. That's a proprietary file system that we've written to replace our legacy file system. It's scalable, it's easy to manage, and it's fault tolerant more so than ever before. All right, again, Bill Thompson of EditShare, thank you so much for spending some time with us, and we certainly wish you great luck and great success at, uh, at the 2017 NAB show. Have a great show. Hey, this is a cat named Mo, on-air personality from 1025 The Bone, Tampa, Florida, and you are watching NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast Beat. Hello and welcome to NAB Show Live. I'm your host, Ryan Salazar, and we have a very special guest today. Uh, we're talking about cyclorama walls, psych walls. So, uh, Todd Dean, how you doing, sir? Very nice good, to how chat are you? with you. So, a lot of photographers, videographers, uh, educational institutions, they, they want to shoot in front of a wall. So a black wall, a white wall, gray wall, whatever, uh, for photography or video. And, and I hear it's been used in animation as well, too. So talk about what a cyclorama wall is. Well, a cyclorama wall is basically you curve every 90 degree uh, corner in a room or as much as you want to shoot in front of uh, so that there's no beginning of the floor and, and start of the wall. It's like one big curved um, situation. So in a, in a cyclorama or a psych wall, it's kind of like infinity. Okay, so how do you build something like that? Well, they used to build it by hand and they would cut these ribs out of plywood and they would try to bend boards and the radiuses were always really large because that was the easiest way to bend that board. Today, there's many companies like mine that create prefab situations that you buy and you put into that room. When you build a psych wall, do you really need a psych? The, the, I guess that's the radius. Could you just shoot in front of a white wall, for well, example? Well, sure, you could shoot in front of the wall, but basically what happens if you shoot below the knee, you'll see the corner of the room. Or if you sh if you shoot uh, you know, a big wide shot, you would see the, the vertical corner of the room. And uh, so you either want a one wall psych where you're just going to curve out the floor or a two wall psych where you curve out the floor and the vertical corner and then there's a cornerstone in the middle that connects all all those units together. Okay, so to, to build something like this, does it take a long time? Is it very difficult? Uh, to build the, the old fashioned way, yes. And they're very, they're hollow and they're very, very, uh, you know, uh, easy to damage. Whereas products like I sell are solid polystyrene products and you just glue them in instantly and then you spackle the seams and you can have a psych in a day or so. Okay, so you're saying you don't have to make the physical, I guess, I call no. it the arch, I guess, right? It's, it's the radius, the radius, and there are several sizes of radiuses. We actually sell those two foot radiuses the most often now. Back long ago, when you actually had to build it, you built these large radiuses. It took up a lot of floor space, so you don't have to do that now. What kind of supplies does that take, I guess? Well, basically, we sell you the piece that you're going to glue in. You uh -huh. just got to go out and buy the glue and, and the spackle. A lot of times people just get a drywall person to come do their spackling because it's really quick and easy. But that's really it. All right, excellent. Again, uh, Todd Dean with Affordable Psych Wall Systems. Uh, do you have a website we can share? Yes, it's affordablepsychwall.com. And, um, and basically just look me up, give me a call, and uh, we can talk. All right, again, uh, Todd Dean, Affordable Psych Wall Systems. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Thank <laughs> you.